Okay, we are live. Good morning and hello there. Uh, we are at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin and I want you to welcome to the fourth keynote session of our conference, Central Banking and its Discontents, the Role of Monetary Policy in Contemporary Capitalism. My name is Ula Schenner and I will moderate this keynote session. We have a distinguished guest and uh, let me introduce you to Paul Tucker, who is joining online. Paul was invited to the conference, but couldn't make it to Berlin. Um, he is a, a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and author of a much um, noted book, Unelected Power, The Quest for Legitimacy in Central Banking and the Regulatory State, published by uh, Princeton University Press in 2018. Paul was a deputy governor at the Bank of England and worked in several policy committees. He was also a member of the G20 Financial Stability Board and a director at uh, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlement. Paul will address us online. His title is Post-Pandemic Central Banking and Legitimacy Affirming or Depleting. Before I give the word to Paul, I wanted to give a short frame and introduce you uh, to the topic. Well, the debate over central bank independence is, as you know, uh, evolving controversially, especially after the uh, post-global financial crisis, not at least due to the shift to unconventional monetary policies worldwide with different results. It underlined drastically that uh, not only the pivotal and influential, but systemic role of monetary policy and central banking. While we stumble from crisis to crisis, central banks remain in the spotlight of political economy. Many questions are, and issues are, uh, which are interdisciplinary addressed here also at our conference. While in Western Hemisphere, many moan a repolitization of monetary policy and complain of the uncertain future of central bank independence like Ottmar Issing or mm -hmm. Kenneth Rogoff, who calls to defend central bank independence every day, a country like Turkey, which shifted back to central bank at arm's length and experienced a high return, a return to high double digit inflation. By the way, this is the official, the inofficial inflation is three digit right now. Um, we see also that inflation is back in the US and Europe, triggering controversies on its causality, whether it's demand or supply driven and whether interest rate hikes are the appropriate response. At the same time, systemic problems and new global crisis increasingly shows and reminds us that social and economic transformation will not come with a, with a central bank which should only prim, primarily prioritize and guard inflation as many mainstream economists propose. As Jens uh, van Kloster concludes in his recent article that the ECB pandemic response marked an end of the depolitization strategy, I will add this end comes before. Uh, we have also a critical, yeah, uh, political comic literature, which um, is very skeptic and uh, with this concept of independent central banking. Uh, just as uh, some examples, as Thomas Paley claims, he raises uh, several critical questions. Does the creation of central bank independence rests on a false construction of politics or controversial construction of macroeconomics, which overlook the broad range of discretionary, non-neutral activities of central banks? Is CBI a quasi-outsourcing of interest rate policy, which seeks a non-partisan technocratic super superiority? Or does it facilitate an institutional and cognitive capture by financial interests, which create a focal point which financial markets can use to discipline monetary and financial policy. So these are some of the critical questions. And since I'm one of those who are uh, not only skeptical, uh, uh, but critical with CBI, I'm really looking forward to Paul's contribution and hope that we will have a fruitful discussion. So Paul, thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I, I think your salary should be paid in Turkish lira. Um, I'm not actually. I'm very sorry that I'm not that I'm not there. 
um, my, my wife came down with COVID um, just before the weekend, so it didn't seem prudent um, to take the risk of bringing COVID into the room. Um, and I mean, that means that I get less out of the conference than I would have done otherwise. And I apologize that I'm addressing you like this. Um, I'm going to make five sets of remarks. Maybe it's, maybe it's six before we turn to, to questions. Um, I, I will address the, um, the big issue that's just been set up kind of rather indirectly um, by circling around it. And then maybe we can turn to it in, um, in questions. The, when my book came out, um, Unelected Power, my previous book, um, around four years ago, um, in the way of these things, I got presented at lots of places. And in the United States, the center um, of politics tended to say, leave it to the technocrats. This was, I think this was symptomatic um, of something much deeper that we may turn to um, later. The center of politics in, either, in the UK and continental Europe didn't reply in that rather kind of strange way. I, it, in the US, it was the, the, the response from the progressive left, which I prefer to call the left, and the libertarian right was, was more interesting. Um, they actually agreed about lots of, of things in response to the book, but they described it in slightly different ways. The, the libertarian right wanted to depoliticize um, central banking, and the progressive left um, normatively wanted to politicize central banking and positively held that, of course, central banking was politicized. And, and my reflections on, on this at the time were twofold, one deeper perhaps than the other. The first less deep comment was that I was struck um, in conversations with people from the left that whenever they talked about central banking and the importance of a quotidian political input into central banking um, policy, the implicit assumption was that the party that they support, um, whatever that party is, would, would be in power for forever um, or persistently. And they engage less with the thought of how would we feel about this quotidian um, politicization of central banking if the party that we oppose, or worse, a Trumpian type party, were to be in power for a very um, long time. And <clears throat> I, I found that a kind of useful, and I suppose being English, an amusing challenge to present to various friends on the, um, on the left. But I think it uh, pointed to a, a slightly deeper issue, which is that politicization was kind of used in a rather peculiar um, way. I mean, at, at one level, uh, of course, e everything that is decided about the role of the state, and not only the role of the state, in a political community is political. Um, but the, there's more than one level of, of politics in over the past 200 odd years, we've framed this as, as a distinction between the constitutional level and the quotidian um, level. So I think it's quite important not to get to rest arguments on the ECB, which is a very strange central bank, but the, the ECB essentially um, operates or is created and endowed um, at the level of constitutional um, politics of our treaty that is almost impossible um, to change. Most central banks in constitutional democracies um, occupy a space between the constitutional and the quotidian in the sense that they are created by primary legislation. And because it's primary legislation, there is grit in the wheels of the elected assembly um, reversing um, the independence. They, they would have to do so transparently and um, put a, a reform or repeal through various um, legislative um, processes. 
which though I mean I think that's and what it what it what independence represents in that sense is an attempt by legislators to bind their hands on the part of the people. And this doesn't work at all, of course, um, unless all the main parties with the chance of, of forming um, a government or in coalition or, or on their own in a plurality, um, commanding a majority in the in the assembly. So I think I think the the an argument against independence on the grounds that it's political um, or should be um, politicized needs to be slightly more um, refined. It would it would have to be an argument that um, framing independence via legislation in order to put grit in the wheels um, of moving away from whatever objective the assembly has chosen is a bad thing because that choice plainly is political. It is something that, legis if, if legislation isn't political, it's not clear what is. But even when central bank um, independence is enshrined at the constitutional level, as in the euro area, or for example, Mexico, that's also a, a, um, a choice in, in politics. Where, by the way, for those of you that are interested in this kind of thing, I, I would define politics um, with Bernard Williams as, as the sphere where legitimacy operates. So this is not a concept of the political that follows Morgenthau, um, let alone um, the dreadful Carl Schmitt. I think that Weimar, Weimar thought, for all, all, almost all wings of Weimar period thought, are in a, in a dreadful muddle, which is not surprising given the circumstances in which they were writing, but I don't think they provide any illumination for us, us today, except during the breakdown of, of politics. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say <clears throat> is that on the left, um, there is a, it's, it is, it is not, not uncommon to find <clears throat> people and friends of mine who think that the move to a focus on price stability is, is, has been a, a great mistake and um, is essentially central bank independence and, and a focus on price stability is essentially um, is, a, is an element and perhaps even an important element in, in some kind of um, neoliberal um, project. And I, I think that's interesting because something I have believed for a very long time, um, I'm not yet old, but I'm certainly not young, um, is that had the, the main countries of the, of the West, which really was Northwestern Europe and, and North America in the 1970s, had been more successful in containing inflation um, both through excess demand and oil price shocks during the 1970s, then actually the, the so-called neoliberal project of Thatcher and Reagan wouldn't have got as much, um, as much traction as it did. They, the two of them may have been elected, but I doubt that they would have been um, in power for as long had the social democratic left held on to... Um, um, their reputation for being economically competent in the eyes of the, of the voting public. And behind that, of course, lies the thought, which, which you may not disagree with, but I think it would be quite hard to kind of demonstrate it was false, um, that price stability um, both doesn't have to be accompanied by a full-fledged free market um, first, and, and secondly, um, price stability is at least useful and, and perhaps um, even important in an economy that is, that is mixed, um, which is kind of what social democratic parties typically aimed for in the, in the past. Um, and I think we've had a, a, a taste of this over the past couple of years, 
in the United States of America, where many people on the left um, and the Fed itself embraced focusing on inclusive growth and many other things, only to discover that when inflation reared its head, and I mean underlying inflation, I don't mean the, the terms of trade shock, um, that when underlying inflation reared its, its head, um, it wasn't popular. Uh, and I think that talk of price controls and cost controls is it at the political level a symptom of kind of discontent um, with inflation that is affecting American families and and others um, over there. So I, I think it's actually I think what I, I putting it more provocatively I think it has been a gift um, or was a gift during the seventies and eighties and again recently from the social democratic left to convey um, that they didn't really think that price stability mattered um, very much, because I think that's helped parties on the other side of politics um, to argue that they shouldn't be um, in power. Um, Germany is interesting in this respect, by the way, and partly because the Bundesbank did better in the 1970s than almost all of the other major advanced economy democracies, and secondly, because the Social Democratic Party um, in Germany has, on the whole, um, not always, um, kind of given almost as much emphasis to price stability as other um, points of the political compass in the states, in, in Germany. So that was my second point. The, the, the third point is about COVID. And the, the, the question that was our, that is posed in my essay question, um, has post-COVID policy been affirming or depleting of legitimacy? Um, if one has to choose, my answer would be depleting. Although I think actually to defend that would require an account of legitimacy, and I'm not going to um, give that, at least in these opening remarks. I do though think that there have been um, a series of, of, of avoidable mistakes uh, or false steps, maybe a better expression over the past two years, which have placed into question what on earth the political community is expecting um, from um, their central bank. And my remarks on this will come in three parts. And I will end, by the way, by saying that in a sense, the central bank is the wrong subject, and the subject should be the ele um, elected branch of, of government. And in some respects, I think this whole debate about central banking is at a number of different levels a form of displacement um, activity. Nevertheless, one could offer criticisms um, of central banking over the past um, two years. The, the, the first um, I would offer is not about 2021, which is where most debates now begin, should the Federal Reserve and others have tightened monetary policy or removed, reduced the stimulus um, after the um, Biden fiscal splurge. Actually, I think that there was a, a false step um, in 2020, and this was a false step either at the level of substance, um, but certainly at the, possibly at the level of substance, I think it was, um, and certainly at the level of communication. And this is, the, the world becomes alarmed about um, COVID in, in March and April 2020, quite sensible to be alarmed about the possibility of plague. Um, there was dislocation in government bond markets, which obviously matter enormously, because for the strongest states, they provide the canonical safe asset other than money itself um, and um, perform the essential function of, of funding the government so that the government can take action um, to protect the people um, from plague and other possible um, mishaps. Um, but what was strange for me and for some others was that in March and April um, 2020 and thereafter, 
um, the central banks chose to buy government bonds. I don't think that was strange. And to describe um, this as quantitative easing. So in the connoting that this was um, monetary policy designed to stimulate aggregate demand. And at the very least, that should um, prompt one to pause and ask a question. I mean, different. I think different answers are reasonable. But to ask the question, do you need to stimulate aggregate demand when aggregate supply is being closed down? And the thought experiment would be, imagine the economy as a whole had closed um, down. Do you, there, is there any point then in stimulating demand? No, there, no, there isn't because there is no economy in that um, thought experiment. The, and what this points to is that, um, and I think central banks did a poor job on this in terms of communication at least, is that it, it doesn't recognize, badging in this QE doesn't recognize that one, that a central bank might buy um, government bonds for any one of a number of different purposes. It's the purpose that matters. One could buy government bonds to stimulate aggregate demand. That's what's going on in some earlier years. One could buy government bonds to finance the government. One could buy government bonds to push up asset prices um, because that would protect the resilience and solvency of intermediaries that would otherwise fail. I'm not saying whether these would be normatively good things or bad things, just enumerating the purposes. Um, one could, one could buy government bonds to get cash to the sellers if they were failing. And one could buy government bonds as a market maker of last resort to, to stabilize conditions in the government bond market. And stabilizing conditions isn't the same as, um, um, as trying to push up the price of government bonds. It's, it's merely trying to, to avoid the vortex, the collective action vortex of everyone running for the exits at the same, same time. Now, I think a, a tremendously strong case could be made um, for, or a strong case could be made for acting as a market maker of last resort in the um, spring of 2020, and, and indeed for getting finance to government so that government could help protect households and small businesses potentially affected, affected by, the, uh, um, by the pandemic. But on either, if, on either of those purposes, um, once government bond markets had stabilized, you'd want the central bank to kind of um, run off or sell back their holdings of, of bonds. And this would have two effects, one of which um, may be really important, and the other one I'm sure is really important. Um, the, the first is that there would then have been less of a monetary overhang um, in the United States, United Kingdom, and elsewhere once the um, fiscal stimulus came in 2021. And one, this, is, this raises the question of whether monetary overhangs whether there was a monetary overhang and, and separately whether a monetary overhang does affect um, um, inflation dynamics. The other, though, which is merely a matter of arithmetic almost, is that because central banks pay interest on reserves, um, this has proved to be a very costly source of funding, as it happens, especially so given the, um, the terms of trade shock and the excess demand. Um, shock because essentially what QE does apart from its monetary stimulus is it swaps um, government debt from fixed rate borrowing to floating rate borrowing and with forward rates at less than 1% um, in late, from late 2019 onwards. Um, those were circumstances in which the rational thing to do was for governments to fund themselves um, long and the fact that they didn't um, is going to lead either to higher taxes or to a, a squeeze in public services over the years to to come. So I think, but even if even if um, um, I'm wrong about all of that and QE was warranted 
in um, in the spring of 2020 and afterwards. Central bankers would needed to have defended it, not in terms of bond market dislocation, which is how they did defend it, but in terms of a need or in terms of getting cash to government, um, both of which I think are legitimate but temporary uh, needs in the circumstances, but in terms of needing to stimulate aggregate demand while aggregate supply was being closed down. And they, and they didn't um, explain or justify it in that, that way. And I think this is quite a strange um, um, thing. Now, moving on to kind of bigger things in a way, um, I think the last thing is the really big thing. The one of the things that has one of the things that happened during um, the global financial crisis, or, or really the aftermath of the global financial crisis from around two thousand and ten, certainly eleven onwards, is this problem of the only game in, in town. And the best way of thinking about the only game of town is as a Stachelberg um, game where the fiscal policymaker gets to move first. And um, one way of thinking about this in, in a kind of how the dynamics would work is there's a very nasty shock to the economy and the central bank governor, chair of the central bank, goes to see, uh, I'm not sure whether it be the finance minister or the prime minister, the president, it vary according to the um, the polity. And they have a discussion about what would be the best um, way of responding to this. And they um, they conclude, and I'm not going to defend this, they conclude that the, um, the best approach would be a combination of fiscal policy and, and monetary policy. Uh, and the central banker leaves the, the room and the politician is left with their political um, advisors. And that, that's the way these meetings work. Um, and once the central banker has gone, the political advisors, whose job, after all, is to advise on politics, um, they start screaming about um, the difficulty that the politician, the elected politician, will have in carrying their cabinet and um, the assembly and their donors and their media backers and their base and the in the country. In other words, there are some short-term um, political transaction costs in the language of political science to be paid. And one of the things that I think it's important to recognize about most elected politicians is that they essentially believe that politics is a random walk. So that if they pay severe political transaction costs today, they think that kind of pushes them in a game of snakes and ladders they think that pushes them down a level and they'll need a piece of luck or an initiative um, of some kind to get them back up a, um, a ladder. It's quite fascinating watching um, this process. Um, they kind of essentially behave like, like political day traders. Um, and that's, that's become um, more pronounced since the advent of 24-7 TV news. Um, which of course preceded social media. And anyway, anyway, so the political advisors are going on in this in this vein pretty intensely because that's the way political advisors behave. And uh, the elected politician says to them, "Well, well, all right, all right, but you know, hypothetically, um, what happens if I don't do anything?" And the political advisors say, "Oh, the central banker will do more." So this is Stackelberg game, which the central banker. Political, the politician then decides not to do anything, and the central banker is faced with trying to do more to achieve her or his mandate. And if you look back at the um, the language that Draghi repeated, repeatedly used, you can find the, this game effectively implicit in his remarks, and not only in the euro area. <clears throat> that's that's the only game in town um, problem that was discussed. Um, a few years ago, popularized by Mohammed al and Raghu Rajam and, and um, Mervyn King and, and others. I, I don't know whether you know the thing, but when it was first used in a, in a conference at, at the BIS in Basel, Raghu Rajam talked about the only game in town. 
And Mervyn King from the audience said, if we're the only game in town, I'm getting out of town. Um, in other words, he thought that it would be a very bad thing politically, normatively politically, to be the only game in town. But it turns out that, um, of course, as in all games in life, that people learn from the game they've played. And once people have internalized the Stackelberg game, um, they realize that actually the, pol the political actor can get the central bank actor to um, intervene in other ways at all as well, um, given the potency of their balance sheet, the latent potency of their balance sheet and regulatory powers. And the crucial thing here is to flip from a macroeconomic use of the, of the balance sheet to, to Picubian taxes, which is the debate about um, central banks, or part of the debate about central banks in climate change, um, in inclusive growth, um, and the role of, of, of central banks in, in potentially pursuing other areas of social justice or kind of existential um, welfare. And um, of course, what I'm gonna come back to is that these are things that could be done and should be done by the elected branch of government. But the first thing I want to um, argue is, is that there is an opportunity cost to, to um, demanding or asking central banks to do all of these other things because um, any time they spend thinking about these other things, they are not thinking about their core mission. And the point of the core mission isn't that it's more important, it's that the monetary authority is the only authority that can do the monetary stuff. Um, and if, if they are, if they are um, spending time on other things, then that raises the chances of them making mistakes on the stuff that only they could do. And I, I enumerated, I gave an example of one mistake, technical mistake that I think they made. I think there were others as well. And I think there's an open question as to whether they were distracted during this period. But I think the deeper point is about incentives. And this is where I want to almost finish, which is that um, all of you will know the academic economics literature on central bank independence that turns on a time inconsistency um, problem or a political business cycle um, problem. And Kidland and Prescott conclude that better a rule than discretion, and Barrow and Gordon apply that to the inflation problem, and Rogoff says, well, actually, you can cure this with a conservative central banker, and Carl Walsh says you can cure this with a contract of some, of some kind. Stack that for a second. Um, there's, there's also, um, there's also but, but, but all of those, all of those um, papers are essentially saying, do not leave the monetary instrument in the hands of the elected um, executive. There's also another um, argument, um, which I make in, in unelected power, and I may be, I'm not sure whether I'm the first, but I might be the first person to have made this argument, which is that in terms of our constitutional values, you, you wouldn't um, want the elected executive branch to have the monetary lever because it's always latently an instrument of taxation and taxation um, for all sorts of reasons, not least of which it's distributive um, um, element, um, discretionary element, is something which we believe should lie with the elected assembly rather than with hundreds of years ago, the king, or today, the, um, the executive. But both of, both of those are arguments about why, um, however powerful one thinks they are, I think they're pretty powerful, um, but they're both arguments about not leaving the monetary levers in the hand of, hands of the elected um, executive. Of course, there's the option of the legislature, but this is, this is kind of impractical for the legislature to have a, um, to vote on interest rates. I think one way of thinking about the gold standard is as a legislative um, monetary um, policy. That's, that's how it worked in the UK, all decisions to come off gold or go, up, go back onto gold during the 19th century 
um, were taken by the, the House of Commons and the British and the British Parliament. But that, that's not practical today. And I'm not remotely advocating it for other reasons, which we needn't get into. So the question is, if we don't, um, what, what that literature doesn't address is, um, is why delegating to somebody called a central bank that is insulated from quotidian politics, but occupies a position in a higher level of politics, a decision taken by the legislature or by, directly by the people if there was a referendum, um, why that should work. And there's a hint of a solution, but I don't think that they completely cash it out in some papers by, by the late um, Alberto Alessina and Guido Tavellini from around 15 years ago, where their model compares a, a political policymaker who wants to maximize aggregate welfare and a, a technocratic policymaker who reaps um, personal returns from delivering um, um, a mandate, an ex ante specified mandate. And under certain conditions in their model, um, you'll sometimes want the politician to hold on to things. And in other circumstances, including monetary policy, you'll want to, in their model, delegate to the, um, to the insulated technocrat with a, with a clear mandate. But what they don't do is they say, well, what are the preconditions um, for the unelected policymaker to, to care about this mandate that they get? And I think the answer has to be along the lines of um, they have to care about the, um, the public prestige and the professional esteem that they will garner from delivering the mandate and care also, also about the prestige and esteem or even shame they will, um, that will come their way um, that they will forego if they don't deliver on their mandate and the shame that may come their way if they don't deliver on their mandate. But this, to the extent that argument works, first of all, it implies that central bank independence isn't going to work in political communities where there is only one source of prestige. So if the only source of prestige in the political community is money, wealth, or alternatively, being close to the president or some great power broker in the society, well then, there isn't any prestige to be reaped from delivering on the mandate. I think actually this matters quite a lot for um, IMF advice to some developing um, countries. In, in societies where there are multiple sources of prestige available, it has an, um, an interesting implication, I believe, which is it points to some a narrower um, construction of central banking rather than a wide one. And this is because if I'm responsible, and you could have a particular person in mind if you wish, um, if, if I hold myself out as being um, um, engaged with climate change and with um, inflation, but I do a, um, a lousy job on inflation, meaning that I you know the built newspaper says I'm a very bad person, um, but actually my credentials as a climate change um, warrior um, are intact, that may be enough for me. The prestige that I seek in the world, um, I may hold on to, and I may not care very much about the professional esteem of monetary economists and all those peculiar central banking types because I've never been um, part of that, of that community. So the point here, um, and that I've used an example of climate change is neither here nor there. It's just because it's topical at the moment. The point here is that if you are going to delegate somebody and they're not succumbing to agency drift, depends upon the prestige and esteem that they will accrue from delivering the mandate that they are given, then obviously you want the mandate to be fairly precise so that it can be monitored. But you also want the mandate to be fairly narrow so that the um, office holder, the unelected office holder, doesn't have access to a range of sources of prestige, meaning that they could um, 
get whatever personal returns that they want without delivering on the price stability, monetary system stability um, um, mandate. And the point here isn't, again, to repeat that monetary stability is the most important thing in the world, although monetary instability has tended to be fairly bad for political societies, including um, the country that you're sitting in. Um, but it's, it's that somebody has to be responsible for monetary instability. You don't want it to be the executive branch um, for the reasons that I've said, the elected executive branch. Um, and therefore, unless you're, one wants to go on a commodity standard, if one cares about monetary stability, then you're going to need a fairly narrow mandate in order to um, cut off alternative sources of prestige um, for the office holder. But to conclude, the big issue here, I think, and I, this is particularly prevalent on the left, um, is why um, and what, what it's, why um, so many people have come to think, so many people on the left have come to think that jobs A, B, and C should be given to the central bank um, move, moved away from the elected um, executive branch. And, and what it signifies about our political society that that has occurred. And I will, I will retell one conversation that I had with some very interesting people in um, one advanced democracy a few years ago in the run-up to, uh, to a general election. And they were, they were arguing that various functions um, around steering credit in the economy to, to try and improve um, um, equality, to try and improve underlying growth, try and improve regional um, welfare, try to improve social justice in a way, that that should all be part of the job of the, um, of the central bank. And I asked, the, I was part of a small group, um, giving them some technical advice. Uh, I've done that for the respectable right as well as the respectable left. And, um, and I asked the question, but why do you want this, these functions in the central bank rather than in the finance ministry? And the answer came back, oh, because the central bank's better. Um, it's technically more accomplished than the finance ministry. And I said, well, this is chicken and egg. If you move all the functions out of the finance ministry into the central bank, then the most able people of your generation will certainly want to work in the central bank that are interested in these things. Whereas if you put them in the finance ministry, you'll find plenty of um, very able people that want to work in the finance ministry. And I, and I, think, um, I think it's a very um, interesting thing that there is this debate about um, should central banks have all of these other functions, which the person introduced me to that was hinting at. Well, what about the German finance ministry and the German chancellor and the German parliament being responsible for some of these great um, issues. It's um, turn, turning the central bankers into the monarch that Simon de Montfort and, um, and his colleagues took on 800 years ago um, strikes me as a bit of a, um, a mistake. Thank you, Paul, for your presentation. We have now plenty of time, I think 40 minutes for Q&A. And I open the floor. If you have questions or comments, we have a microphone. Yeah. I think it's Christoph, Christoph Scherer. Thank you very much for the insightfulness of your talk. I wonder whether the key issue is actually not so much the consensus that uh, low inflation is good for society, but the issue is what is driving inflation? And uh, when I started to read newspapers in the early 70s, the Bundesbank and up to now, only saw labor to be at fault and never looked at the markup, the price setting power of 
uh, companies and was overlooking the issue of international trade and the ability of the United States to push down OPEC that the East kind of drivers were also not really considered. So there is a one minded set. And my question to you is, in a way, you focused a lot on the uh, po political community, but what are the peers of the central bankers? Uh, with whom do they mingle? Where do they land a next job like Paul Falker with Chase Manhattan and so on? So what is their actual community which is important for them? And what kind of community is it that then in the end always looks at labor and not at business? Um, shall I answer that question now, or do you want to take some others? I'm ha I, it might be useful to answer it now. It's quite a good, it's quite a big can, question. As you wish, we can, if you want to directly respond, please. Why, why don't I take that one immediately? Well, of course, uh, ongoing underlying inflation is always the fault of the monetary authorities, and it's neither the fault of labor nor the fault of, of, of capital. The nominal trends in the economy over over the medium term are essentially something that the monetary authority um, chooses. Um, and I, I think it's a great mistake to talk in terms of, could the camera go back to the questioner so I can see how the, this is one of the costs I'm bearing by not being in the room. I'd quite like to see how the questioner is um, kind of responding to what I say, not, not so that I can catch him out or anything silly like that, but so that I can kind of make a judgment about whether I'm responding to his question or not. Um, the camera is not moving. No, but he demanded that the camera uh, looks onto the I asked, question. I, I, yeah. asked. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I asked, I didn't demand. Um, <laughs> I um, so I, I mean, if central banks think it's all the fault of labor, then I think that's kind of a pretty outrageous way to frame it. And I think it's also false in terms of the positive economics. Because, of course, in anything like, I mean, I think these words are overly kind of dramatic, but for shorthand, in anything like a wage price or price wage um, spiral, what you have is, is firms fattening their margins in conditions of excess demand, um, labor um, trying to catch up so that they... Um, so that workers aren't just left poorer in, in real terms, and then it goes around again. And neither of them to blame, because what they're responding to is the, um, is increased in the increasing price level um, or accelerating, accelerating um, price level. I think this, by the way, is to be distinguished from an exogenous cost shock of the kind that OPEC um, delivers, which is economists will think of as an adverse terms of trade shock, which is what many of us are suffering, suffering at the moment. And there are two things to be said about such shocks. One is just the country as a whole is just poorer as a result, if one is a net importer of, of energy in the current case. And secondly, imagine the, the cost shock comes on one day, energy prices go from 10 to 100, and they stay there. Well, that will drive up inflation. The headline, well, that will drive up the headline measure of inflation. That will drop out of the inflation measure after 12 months. But the economy will still be, um, the political community, the society will still be poorer. So one has to distinguish um, what in the UK at least is being called the cost of living crisis which is to do with an adverse terms of trade shock that renders the economy as a whole poorer. Um, and there's nothing one can do about that in aggregate, but it raises all sorts of questions about distributional policy, who is hurting the most, what can the fiscal authority do to help those that are hurting the most relative to those that um, can absorb the pain um, um, a bit more easily because they've got surplus resources of some kind otherwise known as savings, um, and to distinguish that from any problem of underlying um, inflation. And actually, we had this in the UK, and I was 
forget the years, 2010, 11, there was cost shock from abroad. Um, the Monetary Policy Committee, of which I was then a member, let, um, in the language of monetary economics, we accommodated it. We let inflation go up to, it went up to 5%. Um, there were lots of people saying we'd lost control of inflation. We said we hadn't because we saw no shift in underlying inflation expectations or what sometimes are called nominal trends. And lo and behold, inflation came back down towards the, um, towards the target. Um, that was the first part of your question. The second part of your question I'm very sympathetic to. Um, um, I, I, I would say two things. The first is I think this means that the people that occupy, this is a necessary or possibly necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, the people that occupy the most senior central banking posts should be quite old. They should be towards the end of their careers. If you, if you appoint someone to a position of great power in their 40s or even early 50s, it's quite unreasonable, I think, to, to argue that they should have, that when they retire from the central bank, um, that they should then just go and sit in their garden, that they should have no other um, activity. And not everybody will, that holds those positions will want to be like me. I'm trying to make a second career in writing books, essentially, and hanging out in Harvard. But I, the idea that all central bankers should have the set of preferences that I have, I think would be unreasonable. Um, but I do think there should be um, greater restrictions on, on moving into, into the banking um, um, sector. I'm not sure that applies to the rest of the non-monetary parts of, um, of finance. And, and, and some of them may choose to do things that you personally would disapprove of. Um, but I, I think that, you know, goes to debates about kind of what does negative liberty mean in, um, in our society. But I, I, I am very sympathetic to what you, um, to what you um, say. Okay, let's continue with other questions. Katarina, you raise your hand, and then you and you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. I'm basically building on the previous uh, questionnaire, and I, I'm just, I think I agree with you that maybe central bank independence should not be the only um, topic of debate. We could also think about impartiality. And I'm just wondering whether there is a second story to the story you were telling about um, the meeting between the central banker and the prime minister or president or finance minister. Um, does the central banker, after he leaves that meeting, go back to his office and have a phone call with the other side, which is the financial sector? Um, I guess we know from memoirs and stories about the, of the great crisis that, of course, they do. But I was struck by the fact that in your story, the, 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 um, the tension, the political economy was exclusively between a potentially independent bank, uh, independent bankers who are trying to pursue their mandate, and the politicians who are either incapable or unwilling to fight the political fights. Um, but one could also imagine a central banker that says, we will push the politicians to do the right thing, but there might be somebody else in the room who says, you can't, because the financial system might implode if you do that. Well, I, I think there are two um, different elements to, to that, which is, do I think it's useful to talk to the financial system in order to make normative judgments about what to do? No. Um, I don't say that as a matter of principle. I say that from kind of long observation and, frankly, an enormous amount of experience of talking to the finance people in the financial services industry around the world. Do I think it is useful to talk to the financial people in the financial system about how the plumbing works and the market microstructure and and technical things, yes, yes, I do. Just as I think it's useful to talk to people in um, business and, and households about how various parts of the labor market and product markets work, you can't, not everything is in a textbook, not everything is in, in the data. I'll give you a practical example of the latter. In the early zeros, um, I don't know exactly when, um, maybe 2003 or so, a number of us on the UK Monetary Policy Committee 
including me, were moving towards voting for um, um, slightly higher interest rates. And Mervyn King said, well, I'm not sure about this because I've just come back from a visit to some part of the country. We, we used, I used to do about six visits a year. He used to do about 10. I did more international stuff than he did, I guess. Um, and he said, and everybody's talking about um, lots of workers turning up from Romania and Poland and Romania was I think the order in which he said it. And if that's right, there's more supply capacity in this economy um, than is showing up in the data. And therefore, the prospect of excess demand isn't as strong as some of you are, um, are suggesting. Anyway, we did a survey and the agents around the country um, um, looked into it and it turned out that was um, absolutely right. And I think one can have similar conversations um, around with, with people in the financial services industry. I think it's quite important that senior policymakers and certainly the governor or the chair of the governors shouldn't have those conversations with finance herself or, or himself so as to remain slightly insulated um, from that. And then you introduce something else, which is, I think, different from the kind of discourse dialogue thing, which is, well, what happens if there will be a um, um, financial system will collapse if policy action P is taken? Well, first of all, one has to kind of form the probabilistic view um, on, on that proposition. And then if one accepts that proposition, well, then if you take the, the purported action, you will unleash a massive um, negative aggregate demand shock. So, so if you're trying to lean against aggregate demand, bringing down the financial system, it's a, it's a rather dramatic way of doing it, and you may over, overshoot. On the whole, if you, I mean, it depends on the, the nature of the interest rate exposure of the, of the banking system which you can think about this as fixed rate mortgages versus floating rate mortgages. On the, on the whole, um, if that is a risk, quite apart from taking action to strengthen the banking system, then fiscal policy is quite a useful way of intervening rather than monetary policy. Um, because fiscal policy is on the whole going to um, kind of affect the the bank's net interest margin um, rather less directly than a, um, than a move in, in monetary policy. But that, that, that last bit is speculative because it depends on so much. So should what a central bank be aware of what's going on in different sectors, including finance, you bet. And the only reason finance matters in this or gets so much attention is it's part of the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. And what's more, it's part of the early phases of the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Um, does it normatively matter what financiers think you should do? No. Um, you're as independent from them as you are from quotidian um, politics. Um, should the collapse of the financial, incipient collapse of the financial system weigh in your monetary policy um, decision? Yes. But not not because f f wealth the welfare of financiers is important. But because the All welfare. Right, we have further mm -hmm. questions. Uh, first, one, two, three. Maybe we can collect now, like three questions. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Marijn van Sluis. I'm an, uh, a constitutional lawyer, and you mentioned constitutional aspects a couple of times. So. Let me first see if I, could, I got them straight before uh, uh, turning to the question. So you note that a uh, legislative decision to create central bank independence is, uh, is, uh, is as political as it gets, and therefore also uh, <coughs> a, um, uh, inherently politicized. And then you equate it in, uh, in the sentence after that that the same goes for constitutional decision making, for example, the Maastricht Treaty as a constitutional event, as a political decision. Um, and then did not 
further distinguish, make any 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 distinguishing between those two types of of of, of backgrounds for central bank independence. And later on, you said that as inflation is a form, if I understood you correctly, that since inflation is a tax and taxation has to come, decisions on levels of taxation have to come from the legislature instead of the executive. It is a matter to be done through a legislative decision on central bank independence and not something to be decided by the executive. Um, so first, that if I summarize your argument here uh, correctly, so my question then would be, aren't many things that the executives do a form of taxation? That we let the executives decide on, on implementing regulations that favor one industry over slightly over another. We have <coughs> a decision by the commission to include gas and nuclear in in a taxonomy that you know, one can see that as a form of taxation or a form of a subsidy. So we allow, regardless of whether I think that's a good decision or not, but we allow the executives to make all kinds of those decisions. So I don't see if that's really a constitutional argument in favor of central bank independence. And on the, and on the first point, don't you think it matters greatly the, the manner in which central bank independence is established? Yes, a constitutional decision is a political decision, but it changes how politics thereafter can react to central bank independence. If it is a, le a simple majoritarian legislative decision, it is also a simple majoritarian legislative decision thereafter to reverse or to tweak or to adjust central bank independence. And with a constitutional level decision, that's simply not possible. So it is a minority that can block changes. In the EU, it can be Malta, Luxembourg, or the Netherlands that can change, that can block changes to the ECB's independence, or Poland or Hungary, not even in the, in the Eurozone. So doesn't it matter then greatly for the continued legitimacy? Um, I'm not part of the generation that got a vote on either the Maastricht Treaty or the Lisbon Treaty, and still my generation is captured by it, and there's a minority that can stop it. So doesn't it matter greatly how you construct CBI? OK, thanks. You? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, thank you first and foremost also for this uh, very interesting talk and the ideas you forwarded. I also want to come back to the uh, little anecdote or the little image that you uh, post of the politicians meeting um, with the central banker. And I want to um, now stress another point that I think was omitted from this little tale. And um, I wonder about this because I was just looking into it in my master thesis. And I think Daniela Gabor has just written a very intriguing paper on this last year, also for Heinrich Böll Stiftung making the argument that the problem is not so much also the politician being scared of certain um, opportunity costs or certain, uh, certain political price that he or she will have to pay, but also the central banker not really reassuring politicians of fiscal activism by keeping um, the disciplining forces of government bond markets intact and you, in a way, proved this point also by saying that the way that central banks um, justified or vindicated their bond purchases at the outset of the corona crisis, they did not say, well, we want to support fiscal activism. We want to support fiscal policy. No. They framed it in... They did say that. They did say that. They did say that. Okay, sorry, then I got this wrong. It's, it's in, in, I think, Daniela's argument was actually put, like focusing on the years before, uh, during QE and during the um, asset purchase programs of the Fed and, and of the ECB. So during these years, at least, uh, it's true that the Bank of England did that ex explicitly during Corona, uh, COVID. But I think in, in, in general, as far as I'm aware of the, of the literature and of the communication by central banks, there is not a very clear, clear communication towards fiscal politicians, hey, go forward we will back you up. I wonder if a central bank, albeit being independent, could not um, 
change its style of communication and reassure fiscal policy a little bit more to fulfill the tasks it, it, it is actually meant to, to do. Because I concur also that a central bank is not the fiscal arm of the state, and it should not be. OK, thanks. Paulos, the next. Yes, hi, Paul. This is Pavlos. Finally, we meet somehow. <laughs> OK. Um, I have a question also about the question of legitimacy. I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around that because it's, it's not an easy topic. And um, the literature on central bank independence, especially from the 70s onwards, justifies independence to a large extent on the idea that politicians are self-serving agents who are only looking at short-term costs um, and kind of like short-term gains that can have from elections. And this is one of the ways that CBI has been justified. But in discussing and describing the reasons why central bankers care about their mandate, you mentioned the questions of like uh, public image, prestige, and professional esteem. And my question is, is there something less or more self-serving than that? If politicians are, are accused of being self-serving, but central bankers are meant to keep a mandate just because of self-defined, self-imposed, and I might say discretionary um, criteria, and they're not even facing elections at the end of that. Shall okay. I? Yes, I think we can now. Um, let me let me begin with the second question and then go to Pavlos's question and then to the um, to the first one. The, I, I haven't read, I haven't seen Daniela's paper, but um, in the way that you presented it, something seemed to be missing that was quite important, which is one of the because you talked about bond market discipline. One of the things that quantitative easing has done is switched off that um, bond market discipline. Uh, that's a positive proposition. One, one could take a, um, um, a normative view of that, or one could take different normative views on that. I, I tend, tend myself to think that there has been disutility in, in switching off that um, discipline, not not because I think that um, bond markets get things right, but because I think it provides some kind of external check on the, if you like, the combined monetary fiscal um, state. The the when you when you say um, central banks should be in the business of saying. Um, go forth and multiply of fiscal authority. Implicit um, in that, I think, is the, is the proposition that the capacity of the fiscal authority to, um, to adopt a kind of active fiscal policy, by which I guess you mean with more debt rather than more taxation, um, depends upon the central bank. I basically don't believe that. I, th I think the, the capacity of the fiscal authority, um, so this is a positive proposition, I think the capacity, capacity of the fiscal authority to, to engage in an active fiscal policy, debt-financed stimulus, depends upon um, the confidence that borrowers sorry, that lenders have in the, in the institutions of government being able to course correct at some stage in the future, if ever that proves to be necessary. In, in other words, behind fiscal credibility always lies the question of the credibility of the, of the basic institutions of the state um, themselves. The, the most... This is only one version of that point, but most hyperinflations 
end up being solved by a fiscal reform, not by a monetary reform. Tom Sargent's little book on, on that from the probably the early 80s, is, which talks about the Eastern European, Central European hyperinflations and about the French Revolution, is incredibly um, interesting. Um, but I certainly don't think that the central banks over recent years have been any constraint um, on fiscal activism at all. In, in, a, in a world where the central banks are doing QE um, and maintaining their policy rate at a very low level and the nominal and real forward rates are incredibly low, is, is not a world where um, many um, macroeconomists would think that there were severe fiscal constraints facing the advanced democracy economies. I mean, Olivia Blanchard has set out why these are circumstances in which, because long-term borrowing costs were so low, um, a higher level of debt was sustainable. And I was arguing earlier, um, better to borrow long and do fiscal um, stimulus than or on floating weight from the central bank. Um, turning to Pavlos, this question, I, I won't give you my account of legitimacy. Around 100 pages of my forthcoming book, Global Discord, is kind of devoted to that. And some of it is in um, Unelected Power. It's basically David Hume meets Bernard Williams, um, synthesized in a way that I don't think has been tried before. But, um, your, your, your description is right. Um, and my response is, yeah, well, so what? That doesn't mean it's bad. Um, that means um, Hume has a bit in, I think, the treatise, and maybe the inquiry, where, where he says, well, actually, we should, we should, when we're designing institutions, we should treat everyone as a rogue. He means a free rider. Um, um, e even though that, in fact, is not true. Um, of course, he's trying to handle the problem of the name that he talks about in the inquiry, but in specific circumstances. And it's the idea of delegating to a central bank, or let's say to, to a constitutional court or to an appeal court, and, and thinking um, that the holders of that power are, are the embodiment of Aristotelian or Confucian virtue is quite a reckless thing um, to do. There, there was a um, Zunsi, the, um, um, the ancient Confucian philosopher, the one that follows um, Mencius. He, he thought we could nurture people into virtue and that institutions um, couldn't, we shouldn't bother to design institutions. Um, we should just rely on the nurturing of of virtue. And I'm effectively saying that I think that's a mistake. I think one should try to nurture virtue as best one can, but I think one should design institutions as well to be resilient against um, lack of virtue. And so the people that hold these positions, they're just men and women or people, and they've got their own interests. And they're obviously ambitious people because otherwise they wouldn't be um, um, occupying those positions with all the kind of character faults that come with ambition and character strengths. And so I was trying to design a, a system where you delegate, but you, you allow for, if you like, the, the, the flawed um, people who occupy these positions. So I, I don't think delegating to um, central banks is either about cognitive excellence um, nor about nor about virtue, but I think it's about about design and actually about about inducing something that looks like virtue, and then hoping that that virtue will be internalised in some kind of reflexive um, way. Now to the constitutional um, question. So I think this is a really big deal, and um, your description of what I said is is kind of more or less. Um, right, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that. In a, in, in a sense, this is all about commitment devices, and law itself is a commitment device. Ordinary law is a commitment device. Otherwise, the king or queen comes in each morning 
and decides how they want to use their powers today. And how does a commitment device work? A commitment device works by raising the, the audience costs of, of um, diverging from one's promise. Um, and then there, if, if one accepts that kind of broad framing, then there are degrees of entrenchment. And although I think this is where I'm going to um, challenge you a bit, there's the kind of constitutional type entrenchment, there's kind of embedding things um, via um, ordinary legislation, and then there is just um, total discretion. The, the thing about the constitutional is you, you didn't make a distinction, which I understand in a European context, between um, there's a difference between um, provisions of constitutions which are formally amendable and those that are not formally amendable. So there's a difference of degree formally. And then secondly, de facto, there it matters a great deal whether um, um, the polity still has the capability to amend provisions that are amendable. So yes, there's a super majoritarian requirement, but actually can it ever realistically be reached? So personally, I think that one of the big things going on in the United States and it's been going on there for decades, which is why I think it's why we are where we now are, is that the, the processes for constitutional amendment that exist in Hamilton and Madison's document are no longer operative. And so the Supreme Court becomes a discretionary constitutional amendment um, um, machine. The, similarly, the European Treaty, the Maastricht Treaty, is formally amendable, but it's utterly unrealistic that it would ever be um, amended. But the, but the challenge here for the European Union is if you didn't embed it in the treaty, so in a world where there isn't really a legislature um, and there isn't a fiscal um, authority, where, where would you um, do that? And I think that too little time was spent on, um, on, on this. On, on the, there isn't enough time probably to spend on this. I think you make a very good challenge in terms of regulation. Um, Richard Posner, on the whole, I'm not a fan of Posner's, um, um, published an article many, many, probably two or three decades ago, pointing out that regulation often or always had the effect of, had, the, had distributive type effects that taxation um, has. And I agree with, with that. But I think there's a distinction between that and the raising of resources. And the image I would give you is that if President Trump um, 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 had controlled the money um, press, he would have built his wall. Um, his wall would have happened. When I say this in America, people say to me things like, yes, but spending has to get approved by Congress as well. This is a pathetic response, quite frankly. The only reason the control on spending works is because um, of the access to resources is controlled by Congress itself. If, if, if I have the resources and you say, well, you can't spend this money, and you say, well, bugger off, I'll do what the hell I like with the money I've got, I'm going to go down and, and, and build a wall. And then you have a kind of interesting question about who the military would support. Um, so I think that there, is, that there is a slightly richer argument would distinguish... Um, the fiscal thing into two dimensions, the distributional um, element and the resources element. But actually, I want to synthesize the two in ways that I haven't got time to do now. But I think it's a good challenge. Thank you, Paul. I think the last point you mentioned was also a topic in the panel while central bank independence in, independence in the interwar period were discussed, where it came as an argument to prevent wars to cut uh, governments for access to military spending. We, um, we have one more question here on the left. Hi, Paul. It's good to see you. Um, this is Leah. <laughs> uh, I just want to push you on your answer to the last question, perhaps unsurprisingly, given our conversations in the past. And just and something that you said in the talk which is you seem to think it's impractical 
to have real legislative control over this power. So you collapse the choices right into an independent central bank or executive control, which you argue, as you just did, is an issue. But I, I disagree about the legislative control possibility. And I think it's a red herring to suggest that the only way to establish legislative control over monetary policy powers is if Congress is actually, or the legislature, is actually setting interest rates, right? Of course, they can uh, exercise power at all different levels and could engage in a sort of active management, regularly revisiting, you know, mandates, tools, sort of levers of power without actually engaging in day-to-day -day sort of policymaking as they do across many policy spaces, right? Other policy spaces. I mean, imagine something similar, an annual credit guidance power, right? Similar to a sort of bu annual budgetary process or a, you know, regularly revising the sort of structures, uh, you know, the first two central banks in the US, of course, were temporarily chartered, and they had to come back and be rechartered every 20 years. Now, I'm not saying that's the perfect mechanism, but there are, to me, there's obviously a lot of space between Congress or the legislature setting interest rates and a deeply independent central bank. So I'd like to just hear, hear push you a little bit on that. Yeah, we have well, five minutes left. Sorry, Paul, before you start, yeah. uh, we have five minutes left, so I think we will ha now have Paul's answer and then one last short question. Okay. Uh, I, basically, I, I basically agree, Leah. Um, and the Bank of England had a, um, a temporary charter um, initially. One, one, one should be a bit careful about temporary charters because it, it acts as a, a game between the, um, an interesting structured game between the central bank and the... Um, um, and the assembly. So in Bank of England history, when the government was under pressure, um, the Bank of England would get the parliament to renew its, um, um, its charter early and for longer and kind of vice versa. The, so, so I think it matters. Um, secondly, I think the periodicity of reviews or charter renewal matters a great deal. I think if you had them every year or every six months, um, then you should expect higher inflation expectations or at least a higher inflation risk premium. And the thing about an inflation risk premium is that it's a real um, cost. If equilibrium rates at the moment, real rates are around one, a, um, an increase in the inflation risk premium of 25 basis points would be would be gigantic. And I, I picked 25 basis points because people that do these things suggest that that's how much the inflation risk premium fell um, on, on, um, on Bank of England independence. And that should bother people on, on the left or right a lot on the right because they'd have fewer tax cuts they could make and on the left because the state would have to shrink other things being um, other things being equal. On um, similarly with credit guidance, I have no objection. What I feel about central banks and climate change is what I object to is Christine or Andrew sitting around saying what climate change measure do we think we should take? I've got no difficulty whatsoever with Parliament or the Council of Ministers and the Parliament in Europe legislating some constraints, saying you can't do this and you can't do uh, that. That's all part of the kind of the terms of the mandate kind of commitment device that I was talking to in the context of constitutional politics. I think that there is um, a question in terms of how stable those requirements would be if you, if you have, if they changed with each party um, then the central bank would come to look just like a kind of an arm of either the Democrat Party or the Republican Party. And I think that too would probably feed into higher um, inflation expectations because they would look less insulated from quotidian um, politics. As it happens, I, I, I think that in most countries, um, the state has no... Um, capacity or willingness to put such constraints in legislation at all. And 
my view on that is not that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's that I think that people like Yulia should spend more time thinking about why that is so than about what central bankers should do. Okay, Paul, we are running out of time. We have two very short. Do you want to? Joshua? No. Okay, Joshua, the last okay. question. I try to be short. Hi, Paul. Um, Hi. First, just to wrap it up, I was very happy to see that actually we agree on many points. Yeah. First, it's not useful that central banks are the only game town. Yeah. We have to get in the finance ministry and ministry of economics much more. We have to politicize the economy much more. Fantastic. Second, state financing. I was very happy to learn that you're at least partly in favor of state financing. The question would be then, is that being necessary by the secondary market, or could that be directly then financing the state? But we should have to change something there. Third, um, and state financing is not the only thing. Yes, taxation is important, especially rising top tax rate. So there's much more to do on the political side. And I agree that QE was partly relieved the tax burden of states. The problem is now, and this is our question of first, um, as, uh, as um, we, we, we've heard before, this relief was only a, um, f a re um, f relief for a short time period. That is to say, well, QE is now announced to be over. So we have the burden again there. So saying that, yes, there was this relief because of um, QE and, and low policy rates is right, but if you cannot count with that for the future, it's not helping you. You have to stick partly to austerity. And my huge question now at, for the end is actually, well, how have we, um, how to imagine central banking in times of permanent crisis? That's a huge point. We know that we we will not get out of the crisis. I mean, we're, every year we add more crisis to that. So we are in permanent climate crisis. We have the, um, the invasion of Russia, uh, from Russia to Ukrainian, Ukraine. And we have, of course, then the pandemic. Yeah? But wouldn't you say, because of that, we have to get, get rid of market neutrality? We have to discuss um, um, central bank independence and especially the state financing issues. So, what does it mean for central bank to be to 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 be in this permanent crisis times? Thank you. Oh, thanks I, I for this think, last short question. <laughs> I don't think we're remotely in permanent crisis. I mean, my country hasn't had a serious crisis. Um, at the level of the constitutional state since 1688. If, if one sits in Germany, um, Germany can achieve this too. It doesn't, it doesn't have to throw itself into crisis. It's tempted with it. Its approach to Italy and Greece, as I said to a colleague when that was going on in 2011-12, do you want to wreck our continent for the third time in a century? Um, but this, But we don't have permanent crises. We have difficulties that the state is is capable of navigating and, and making choices um, about. The thing about um, QE and, and eventually it go, um, gets run off in, in some way. Well, the nature of a political community is that it has to make um, all sorts of choices about the structure of the economy, about the structure of um, norms of, of, of society. Can only make choices around that so much, and it has to make choices around tax and spending. And those of you, those of you in the room who know me will know that I'm not partisan at all. I think this is absolutely fantastic that we have devices in constitutional democracies for making for not only um, peaceful transfers of power via elections, but for making peaceful choices about these difficult. Um, questions. Democracy is, is, among other things, it's an exercise in trial and error where we discover what works and what doesn't work over time and we, and we, and we tack. So I, although we, uh, uh, I welcome that we agree about some things, I do not think we're in permanent crises. Um, I, I, this is a kind of trope of, uh, of, of the Marxian left. I don't know whether you're a member of the Marxian left. <laughs> 
but it just kind of hasn't been true. If you think about the last um, 200 years in those parts of, of Western Europe that have largely been at peace, it's been absolutely extraordinarily successful. We haven't remotely been in, um, in permanent crisis, except when various people have decided to go to war. And wars are, of course, a very bad yeah. thing. In some respects, they represent the breakdown of politics. Civil wars even more so. Yeah. I think this one could also relate it to the do-commerce uh, thesis. But thank you, Paul, for your contribution. It was a pleasure to have you here. And thanks for the audience for your uh, contributions. You came early after the conference dinner. Uh, I know this was not an easy task. And thank you for all the technical stuff, for this excellent work. And hope to see you uh, on another occasion, Paul, maybe not, then not online in a post-pandemic context. Oh, it's all right. it's nice to be there. And I, I, I love the image of everyone being so hungover from yesterday evening. Um, <laughs> and I very nice to see you. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. And take care.